All right, we're going to start uh, volume two with heat and temperature, starting with an introduction. So um, when you talk about heat and temperature, you guys have some intuitive grasp for what's going on. What's really happening is that you're transferring energy to make the atoms in something vibrate. Um, and, and there's a few different ways that you can do this. So you get some heat transferred through, uh, through light, just because objects are at high temperature, that's called radiation. And then you can also get heat flowing directly through objects that are in contact with each other. And then you can also get convection, which is where there's movement of, of air around um, or other or other fluids around that are actually transferring the heat. So here you can see um, all three mechanisms that you have radiation from the fire coming and hitting people and they can feel the warmth from the radiation. And you also get convection around the fire so that they can feel the warm air move from the fire. Um, and as well, they're sitting on the snow. So there, there is a heat transfer from them to the snow. Um, and we talk about things that are in equilibrium. Um, if we have, if the therm if you have two things that are in equilibrium, you say that they have the same temperature. Um, so if in, in the way that we do a temperature reading, you are actually, the thermometer is actually in, with, with a liquid thermometer, the thermometer is in equilibrium with the object. Um, so you, if you have something, if A and B are in equilibrium, or sorry, if B and C are in equilibrium, when you move the thermometer from one to the other, the temperature stays the same. <clears throat> And these are three different types of thermometers. One is a liquid thermometer, um, usually alcohol these days because people got sick of dealing with mercury spills. Um, and then, you know, the, the alcohol expands more rapidly than its container. So the level of the alcohol changes depending on the temperature. You also can use um, the, the this one right here shows a thermometer that has squares um, in plastic that have different films <clears throat> that are heat sensitive. And then finally, this one's really cool because this actually uses black body radiation. <clears throat> it's looking at the um, it's it's looking at the the light from something. It's measuring the infrared radiation from another object and <clears throat> using that distribution to get the temperature. Um, when we talk about temperature scales, there's three scales. Because we are in the United States, you will often come upon the Fahrenheit scale, um, where actually the 100 degree point was in the Fahrenheit scale was set by Fahrenheit's wife, um, who had an abnormally high body temperature for some reason. Um, I heard a rumor once that I was very excited about that it was because of the rectal temperature of a cow, which does also happen to be around 100 degrees Fahrenheit. But alas, that is not true. Um, it was set by Fahrenheit's wife. Um, and then for some reason, we have the freezing point of water at 32 degrees in the Fahrenheit system. Not sure why 32 degrees. Um, but this is what you will normally see in the United States and what you probably grew up with. Uh, we also have the Celsius system, which is used in most of the rest of the world, um, where the zero points and the freezing points kind of make sense. They are set by um, <clears throat> the freezing point of water at zero degrees and the um, boiling point of water at 100 degrees. And then the human body temperature is 37 degrees on this scale. Um, and then we have the Kelvin system, which is um, not used much outside of science. Uh, the, the scale is very closely related. That one, um, one degree Celsius is the same thing as one Kelvin. Um, <clears throat> Kelvins do not get the degree tacked onto them. Um, but the, in Kelvin, you're measuring the absolute temperature of something such that at zero Kelvin, which you can't actually ever reach, things stop moving. So zero Kelvin is where everything is totally still. It has no thermal motion. 
and in this at this point the freezing and this scale the three freezing point of water is 273 um so that the the zero degrees celsius is so the absolute zero is negative 270 degrees celsius um and you will mostly in your career as a physicist be using Celsius and Kelvin when you're um, actually measuring things in the lab. Um, if you get really adept at it, you'll start to be able to think in both. Um, okay, and thermal expansion. Um, when things warm up, they tend to expand. Almost everything expands when it warms up. So when you're building things, you have to take that into account. So here you can see, for example, some expansion joints in a bridge um, so that as the bridge heats up, it doesn't crack and it doesn't buckle. It doesn't change shape um, so that the bridge can pretty reliably have the same shape because you don't want your bridge bending. Um, and in general, things do expand at different rates when they um, <clears throat> are heated up, um, even different metals. Um, so here you can see a biometallic strip. If it has temperature, so if one metal expands faster than the other with increasing temperature, the strip will start to bend depending on, uh, will start to bend when the temperature changes. Um, th this is actually incredibly useful in your everyday life everything, most things expand when they heat. So for instance, if you're putting your oven on a cleaning cycle, don't leave the racks in because they will expand and they can actually warp the oven. Um, and I will admit that I did that to my oven. Um, but it's important to remember in general, things do expand and you have to take into account that expansion when you're building stuff or even doing things in your daily life. Um, in general, things expand in all directions at the same time. So if you have a hole cut out of, uh, of some metal, when the metal expands, the hole expands as well. Um, and it's the, so it's expansion in all three dimensions. Um, a notable exception, which you should sear into your brain because our lives literally depend on it, um, is that water, fresh water, actually contracts when it um, when it warms up around the freezing point. Um, so for instance, ice actually has a um, lower density than um, than than water. All right, and then we get to the concept of equilibrium. Equilibrium means, that two things are um, at the same temperature. And being at the same temperature means that on average, the molecules or atoms um, in each object have the same, um, have the same internal energy. Um, so if you have a soft drink, and this is an example of not being in equilibrium, you have a soft drink and you have ice, the ice is, is um, <clears throat> freezing, the soft drink is not, so the, ice, the soft drink is warmer. Um, when you put them in contact, on average, because of collisions of the molecules, um, of the, the water with the can and the ice with the can, um, <clears throat> they will actually, over time, reach equilibrium. This is why when you put ice um, into, when you put soft drinks into ice, they eventually cool down. Um, the, um, at the beginning, the soft drinks molecules have more energy on average than the ice, and the ice is actually bringing the average energy um, in the molecules or atoms down. Um, and of course, we talk about heat and work. They used to be thought of at, before they, um, before we understood them fully as potentially two totally different things. Um, heat is, um, you experience heat um, because uh, you, you have a conceptual feeling of heat um, 
but what's really going on is that it's leading to greater vibe. The more heat is transferred to you, heat technically is not a quantity. It is a process. You can have heat transferred to or from something. Um, and <clears throat> heat, when it is transferred to you, makes your, um, when you become warmer because of heat transfer, the atoms and molecules in your body shake um, more. And one thing that happened is that they proved, Jewel proved that these, that heat and work are equivalent. So that if you do work on something, um, in this case, you're using masses and you are, <clears throat> and the masses turn um, levers that do work on the water. And then the water actually warms up. You can actually measure this um, with the amount of the, with the change in temperature proportional to the amount of work done. So heat transfer and work are the same thing. They're both measures of energy. Um, and here you can see, actually, <laughs> if you drive a lot in the mountains, you I, I don't see the smoke very often, but I can smell it if you have people who um, are driving poorly down mountains or uh, have inadequate vehicles, um, <clears throat> you can actually smell the burning of the brakes. I always smell it far before I see it. And this is actually why they have runaway truck ramps on a lot of those. You might not have noticed them, but next time you're driving in the mountains, if you're driving in a steep, steep area, you'll notice there's, there's some, sit, they might announce runaway truck ramps where they actually the, the brakes burn so much that they no longer work. So they have these uphill ramps filled with sand so that the, the truck can redirect there and stop in the sand instead of continue down the road without brakes. Um, <clears throat> don't do that unless you absolutely need to because it's really expensive to get out of there. All right, phase transitions. So, Phase, we, we mainly talk about four different phase, phases. There's also another thing called a plasma that we're not going to talk about too much. Um, but you talk about solids, liquids, and gases. Solids are very compact. The atoms or molecules in a solid are very close together. Um, they're, they tend to be almost as close as they can physically get so that... Um, you tend to have separation distances on the order of angstroms, um, which is 10 to the negative 10th. So it might be 10 to the negative 9th, depending on what exactly you're looking at. Um, <clears throat> but the separation lengths in a solid between different um, molecules and atoms are very small. Um, you also have liquids. Liquids are a little bit more diffuse um, but so in, in a solid, almost everything is stuck in a given place in a liquid. It can actually move around within the, um, within the liquid. Um, but you're still talking about separations that are <laughs> approximately the size of a bond length. So a few angstroms, maybe up to 10 to the minus nine, but up to 10 or so angstroms. Uh, 10 to the nine, minus nine meters. Um, and then you have gases. And gases can have any type of, any length of separation, um, but it tends to be way large, multiple, you know, way more than 10 to the minus ninth meters, um, things that are far separated so that the molecules and atoms inside of a gas no long, are no longer close enough to have any type of strong bond. Um, so gases tend to be way less dense than liquids and then solids. Um, and we talk about the phase diagram of different um, different different um, molecules or atoms. So here you can see the phase diagram of water, where you have um, at low temperatures, you have a solid. Um, if you, so here, this is temperature and pressure, and this is in atmospheres. So this is regular pressure. So if you want to, this is atmospheric pressure, what you're used to, one atmosphere. So at, at one atmosphere, as you go along the, um, 
as you increase temperature, you go from water goes from a solid to a liquid to a gas. Now, what happens is that if you increase, well, if you decrease the pressure, you actually have melting at, uh, um, you have solids that melt at a slightly lower temperature, but not much. And you actually can get the liquid to last a little bit longer. So basically at very high pressures, the liquid is pushed together a little bit longer. As you go down in pressure, you actually can get, even for water, something called sublimation, which is when you go directly from the solid, um, <clears throat> you go directly from a solid to, uh, to a gas, or, and you can even have a concurrent, um, a concurrent liquid and gas phase. Um, Okay, so I like to talk about, I wanted to show this one. I added this slide. Um, this is, if you go to the Wikipedia page and look at the phase diagram of water, this is in much greater detail because <clears throat> this is what show, shows up in intro textbooks. But actually, even for something we think, you might think you understand water, but water's phase diagram is actually really complicated. There are 18 identified phases of ice, which has to do with the different ways that the, the molecules pack together. So it's not that simple. Um, and it really does depend a lot, depend heavily on pressure. And you'll see that as you get to very high pressures, then this is where you get some of the more exotic forms of, of ice. But just file away somewhere in your head, even water isn't that simple. Um, so here you can see a couple of um, direct, this is called sublimation, so direct tr transitions between a solid and a vapor. Um, so here you have carbon dioxide. You guys have seen this before. Um, if you buy dry ice and you put it in water, the dry ice sublimates, which makes a visible gas. Um, and that's what you, and that looks like smoke, so it's used often at Halloween make fancy displays. Um, but you can also have the opposite where you have liquid, sorry, you have gas water in the air, um, gaseous water in the air that just freezes um, on the side of a window. Hmm. So then we get, um, we can also talk about the equilibrium between a gas and a liquid. So if you have um, if you have a liquid and a gas at the same time, um, you actually have these, they're in contact so that given given enough time, they will be in thermal equilibrium. And what will happen is that they will actually tend towards the, um, they will be very close to the boiling point. Um, and then if you go into a, if you push, force this into a closed container and you heat it up, you are going to increase the temperature, but you're also increasing the pressure. So if we go back to our phase diagram, um, in that case, you're, you're not moving in a, you're not moving in a straight line along here. You are increasing the pressure at the same time as the temperature. So you're actually um, moving at a different point. Uh, you're not moving. That's how you can increase the temperature because you're not keeping the pressure constant. But they are still at equilibrium. So you will still find that both of them are at the same temperature. And this is what you see if you, um, this is what you see if you heat up water. So let's start with ice. Um, and if you heat, and this is the temperature at a fixed pressure as you heat, heat the water up, if you add heat to water, it is going to ice, it is going to melt into water. And while you are in the process of adding that heat, um, you will have a mixture of both ice and water. And at one atmosphere, this stays at one degree Celsius. So if you have a mixture of water and ice, it will be at one degree, or sorry, it will be at zero degrees Celsius. Once you have the water, 
The water can be just above, once you've melted all the ice, it can be just above the freezing point all the way up to the boiling point. So as you add heat, um, you are slowly, um, <clears throat> you're going to slowly add heat and then you reach the, the point where you have a mixture of water and steam. Then when you start adding heat, you're not melting, you're not um, changing the temperature of the water, you, the heat goes into changing water to steam until all of the water is steam. So I'm going to write what's going on in each of these cases. I love assigning a problem like this every year. Um, so here, while you have only one phase, the amount of heat is equal to the mass of the water times the specific heat of ice times the temperature. So in this case, you would go from negative 20 degrees to um, Celsius to zero de degrees. In this phase, the amount of heat is equal to the latent heat of formation of water um, times the mass of water. Um, so for each, for a, per unit mass, the amount of energy it takes to convert that water into, that ice into water <coughs> is a constant called the latent heat of formation. And then when you're here, you're going to have something similar to what you had with melting ice, or sorry, with, uh, with heating up ice. You're going to have a heat, which is M the mass of the water times the specific heat of water times the change in the temperature. And then here, you are going to have another latent heat of formation for steam times the change in the temperature. And then finally, here, you have only one phase. So your heat is M times the C, the specific heat of steam, delta T. So a problem I like to ask, because I think that you need to do it at least once, um, is calculate how much energy it takes to go from somewhere here below the freezing point to somewhere here above the um, <clears throat> vaporization point because you actually need five different, you need to consider it in five different steps and you need five different physical constants. It's a pain to do, so I don't like to assign more than one problem like that, but it's important to remember that all five steps are important. Now you can also get the, the, <clears throat> You can get water forming from the air, and you guys have seen a lot of this um, in the past. Um, you can, so here you have a cool glass, and water forms, um, water is in the air, so the air is, the water in the air is going to condense on the cool glass. Um, now, the gases, so the oxygen, nitrogen, um, Oxygen and nitrogen are mostly not going to form liquids. They, they form liquids at super low temperatures, but the uh, water forms a liquid at um, pretty close to room temperature. So it's easy to get it con to condense out of the air. Um, and those of you in Tennessee know this, that there's water in the air all over the stinking place. So, um, so, Actually, I had an issue with this today. Today, I suddenly had to go defrost my freezer because the door hadn't gotten closed all the way at one point, and air can water condensed out of the um, out of the air. It froze in my freezer, led to a whole bunch of ice, and then the door wouldn't close anymore. Um, so, 
water comes out of the air. It's a major issue. You should remember that there is always water in air. And you can also use this to protect things. So the fact that when you are, if I'm gonna flip back here, when you are here, the temperature is pretty stable. So one thing that they do when these big ice storms come, for instance, when they when it freezes in Florida and they have all of their incredibly valuable orange groves, they go out and they spray water on them and the water freezes. And that actually, because water is going to, the it's close to the freezing point, so it's not going to freeze extremely hard. That means that it's hard because, that it actually, and it takes a lot of energy out of the air. The process of freezing takes energy out of the air, so actually can warm up the air. Um, <clears throat> and by doing this, you keep the, um, you can keep the tree close to zero degrees Celsius and keep it from going lower where damage is more likely. Each tree is going to have a different temperature where, depending on the species, where it tends to start getting tissue damage that is um, irreversible. Um, but so this won't work for all plants, but it will work for many. And it's worth the effort when you have really valuable things like orange trees. All right, heat transfer. Um, so here, you guys already benefit from this. So there's three different types of heat transfer. Um, one of them you are, well, two of them are probably a little bit more familiar, convection and conduction. So convection is when you have a fluid such as air moving and it moves heat because it moves. Um, so this, you guys have heard hot air rises. Um, <clears throat> so you can actually get convection. You will get convection in a fluid anytime that you have the fluid out of equilibrium. And so when you have a window on a cold winter day and you have a furnace, there's going to be air moving between the two of them. <clears throat> That's convection. You can also get conduction where you heat something up um, and it then transfers heat to it. So I did this when defrosting my freezer today. Um, I actually, well, I actually used both. Um, I needed the freezer to defrost, I wanted the freezer to defrost as quickly as possible so my food didn't go bad. Um, so I took a big heavy cast iron pan. Uh, it was my great grandmother's frying pan. Um, it's a fantastic pan and I heated up some boiling water and I brought the boiling water downstairs and I set it on the freezer shelf right underneath the um, right underneath the the ceiling of the freezer which was really hard to start getting defrosted and this did a couple things the cast iron pan um, is very good at conducting heat that's also why you have to be careful when you're cooking with cast iron pans because they they have a high specific heat so they take a while to warm up and then they're very good at conducting heat so they will heat the food up so it's very easy to burn food if you heat your if you in a cast iron pan if you heat the pan up too much so i poured water in there and then the shelf that it was sitting on actually started heating up because of all this hot water in the cast iron pan um, and <clears throat> then it was through convection the steam was rising in the hot water which actually melted the the um, ice on the shelf above <clears throat> so practical. Um, and then um, in that case, it was convection and, con and conduction. Now you also can get radiation. Um, so any hot object, and I have, there's a special section I'm going to go through on this, any hot object is going to emit light <laughs> or electromagnetic radiation. The most familiar is visible light, um, but thermal radiation um, anything that anything will emit light because if it has a temperature and everything has a temperature so everything is always emitting light <clears throat> and that light actually can come hit you and warm you up um, and so if you sit by a fire even 
even if you have, say, a glass door in front of it, you're still going to get heat coming out of it from radiation, um, as well as from conduction, uh, in conduction into the air, and then followed by convection. Um, but any, you can get a lot of light um, from a fire, um, and that will actually hit your body and warm your body up directly. And what happens microscopically, so in, it, even if you have this barrier, so you have some surface. So in the case of that fireplace, there's a, if there is a glass door so that you're not actually getting, you can actually prevent convection if you want, if you have a glass door, but you still have the, um, the air on one side warmer than the air on the other. And the um, so a molecule of gas in the fire side can hit the glass door. It makes the glass vibrate. And then something from the room, a molecule of air from the room comes in and smacks the glass. The glass is warmer than the air in the room. So on average, the glass is going to heat up the air in the room through these collisions. <clears throat> And anytime you have these heat transfers, what's actually going on is that you're, when you have the, the stuff that is at lower temperature is moving slower than the stuff that is at higher temperature. And through collisions, because there's a lot of collisions all the time in all of these objects, you're going to slowly add, slowly increase the temperature of the cooler object. Um, Insulation is used to reduce conduction because if you have insulation, then you have less air moving from one side to the other. The insulation slows down this process of collisions. Um, so if you... Um, If you have insulation, you're actually adding air. You also can add. You also might decrease the density of stuff um, between <coughs> two layers, so that it's harder. You're slowing down the process of um, of conduction. And. This is this is just showing how it happens. You have some heat transfer from from the hot side to the cool side. Um, and fiberglass batting it will because it traps the air in, it reduces the speed at which molecules can move from one side to the other because it gets stuck in the fiberglass. It doesn't have to be batting. When we moved in, um, our house was built in 1965 and the insulation, well, they didn't insulate as much then and the insulation had settled. So one of the first things that we did when we got our house was blow in insulation and take it from about, a, I think at that time, the, root, the ceiling insulation might've been six inches with all the settling. We blew it in so that it was about a foot and a half you immediately, it was in the middle of summer, um, the temperature in the house immediately decreased as soon as we did that. <clears throat> and you can, if you are clever, if you design your house well, or if someone designed your house well, you actually can use convection to help um, get the the air moving around the house to make this more efficient. So hot air rises, you will get these currents that actually if designed well, will lead to the cool air heading back to the furnace to be heated up um, <clears throat> and making it, um, making it warm more efficiently. Good design pays off a lot. Um, and these convection, anytime you're heating something up, you have something out of equilibrium, you're going to get these um, convection currents and they're going to tend to move stuff around so that you, um, 
so that it eventually ends up roughly in equilibrium. And of course, fur of all sorts um, can be, is, is also a form of insulation. It, it basically means that it traps air. So it's hard to get air um, from one side to the other so that things actually do not heat up um, or cool down as rapidly. And clouds are also caused by these, um, by water vapor rising through convection. Um, so lots of applications. And I wanna specifically pull out radiation. When you guys take modern physics, you're gonna learn a little bit more about where black body radiation, about the derivation of black body radiation. Um, but basically any object that has a temperature, which is all objects because you can never reach absolute zero, are going to emit light. Um, and <clears throat> actually it turns out that if you have something, for instance, the temperature of the sun, the sun um, has its peak of um, emission just due to black body radiation in visible light. And that's actually why we evolved to see visible light because it's most of the light that there is. Um, so you can get heat transfer from, for instance, a fire just through the radiation off of the fire. Um, so if you're outside and you're maybe not sitting <clears throat> near enough to the fire to get convection, to get the air coming towards you, you will often still feel the temperature, of the t you'll still feel the fire because of, um, of radiation. Um, so here, this is a the distribution of the intensity. Uh, so for so a measure of how much energy there is in the um, as a function of given wavelengths. Uh, the amount of energy carried by light is a function of the energy of the light. And what you see is that <clears throat> cooler things emit it, um, have a peak that is longer wavelength or closer to the red. Um, warmer things have shorter wavelengths. Uh, so here we call things that are white hot. We perceive white um, when we see all three colors. When, when we see all of the colors at once, we're going to perceive that as white light. Um, so when the peak is in the visible, we see that as white. <laughs> and things that are we may be where most of the light is even too long for our eye to be able to perceive. We still at least see the red, so it looks more red to us. <clears throat> but there's actually a lot over here, and water molecules, and most of us are water, we're mostly water, water molecules absorb in the infrared. So your the water molecules in your body will start shaking from this long wavelength radiation well before you can even see it. Um, and that leads to darker objects. Darker objects are better at absorbing light. Um, so they tend to be higher temperature, <coughs> especially in the summer. So if you have darker pavement, ice is going to melt faster on the darker pavement than on lighter pavement. And actually, if you've driven around in the winter, you may have noticed this. So um, the when there's dark pavement, fresh asphalt, it's going to melt, the ice is going to melt faster. And then it might refreeze, which makes it super dangerous. Um, so black objects tend to absorb more energy. They also tend to radiate more energy. So something that is black, you, if you put your, your hands near it, you will feel more energy. White objects reflect more energy and they tend to emit less energy. Um, so a white object is going to stay at roughly constant temperature a little bit, but it's going to hold on to its heat a little bit better. Black object, objects, objects absorb heat um, and they emit heat <clears throat> more readily. <clears throat> and here you can see a thermal picture of a building um, showing temperature variations. This is actually a way that you can look for leaks in your house. You do thermal imaging of your house um, and you can try to identify where you would be best off um, 
adding insulation or sealing cracks. So a few examples, and we're gonna go a little light on examples this time. Um, so this is the phase diagram of carbon dioxide. If you're if given a phase diagram, uh, what is the vapor pressure of solid carbon dioxide at a given temperature? Um, <clears throat> so if we pick 75, negative 75 degrees Celsius, um, the vapor pressure at that point is around a little bit over one atmosphere. <coughs> and if we look at, let's see, for solid carbon dioxide, if we, <coughs> if you go colder, the vapor pressure is lower. Um, and what you see here is that if you are below about five atmospheres, <coughs> you are going to go straight from solid to a vapor. And of course, we are usually at one atmosphere. You don't want to be at five atmospheres. Here you can, so, and then this one, this is a cutaway drawing of a doer, um, which is a, we often use them in labs for cold, holding liquid nitrogen. It's designed to reduce heat transfer. You also can, you know, you also might call it a thermos. It's a really fancy kind of thermos. Um, and it says, talk about each of the, the function of each part. Okay, so the air layer acts as insulation and you may even try it and you, uh, there's often a layer of vacuum and a layer of air. Um, the vacuum, vacuum is the absence of anything. So if there's nothing in there and it's, when we say vacuum, we don't mean nothing because most of the time, because it's really, really hard to get a high vacuum but the pressure in that region is very, very low, which means there's not a lot of molecules there. If there's not a lot of molecules. There's not a lot that can collide with the, um, with the contents um, or with the walls to cool it down. And then the air layer is less dense um, than, than some material. It's gonna provide a little bit extra insulation between this vacuum, <laughs> which may be imperfect as well, and the um, and the outside walls and this rubber support. Rubber is a poor conductor of heat. You need some type of support. Also, here there's springs that's keeping the walls of the vacuum container from touching the walls of the exterior container. And it better not transfer heat well, or else you've just caused another way for heat to get from inside to out. So rubber conducts heat poorly but it is gonna provide some support so that this doesn't fall. You've got a stopper here. This is probably where most of your losses are. Um, and then you have glass walls with silvered surfaces. So those silvered surfaces are going to reflect light very well, which is going to keep things. So remember that things that are white tends to um, not, trans not radiate light very well. and um, not emit. Um, so that's going to tend to keep the energy where it is if you have silvered walls. And a related example, here you have loose fitting white clothing, um, for example, used in the desert. So in the heat of the day, it is going to reflect most of that light and keep it away from your body. Now, if you have my complexion, or even if you don't, um, <clears throat> but if you are pale as a ghost, it also keeps you from getting sunblock, uh, sunburn. Um, it's my favorite form of sunblock is lightweight um, cotton clothing. Um, and then in the evening, <clears throat> it's going to do the exact opposite. It's going to keep your, it's it's it doesn't radiate heat well, so it's going to keep your heat from radiating away from you and keep you warm as well. And with that, we're going to stop this chapter. <laughs>